think you're buying a condo, but you're really buying everything. So you need to look at the siding and the facade. You want to look at the windows. Who's responsible for the windows? You want to know how old the roof is. You want to know how old the cooling towers are at. And then what's the one of the biggest expenses are the parking garages. And what happens is with these parking garages that the salt goes through and into the lower parking garage and sometimes there's several layers and that can cost a million plus dollars to repair these parking garages and so always look not only at the unit you're buying you want to look at the parking structure go in the basement even though it's not your spot just look at the whole thing and then most importantly I tell my clients to get 12 to 24 meeting minute notes because the board will have a monthly meeting and in that meeting they're going to talk about any problem you want to read those another thing you want to get is obviously the bylaws rules and regulations and see if there's any assessments but a lot of these associations will have engineering expenditure projection reports they're like 10 to 20 year expenditure projection reports that tell you what will need to be done between now and the next 20 years and where they're going to need more money and so very important that's actually more important than inspecting the unit brick failure you know brick failure is a problem you know bricks gotta be properly installed it has to have reinforcement it has to have proper clearance if you're going to put reinforcing in it you know it has to drain so you have to put the proper drained space on the the, the, the capillary break they call it you have to have a rain screen or a drainage plane on the back and of course you're gonna to have to have weep holes and if you don't build the brick properly all kind of problems can happen uh Brick reinforcement, the wire, it was placed too close, it rusted, and then pushed up on the brick. Okay. And, and, and now once that breaks, now you get what happens is, especially if it's a southern exposure, the water's going to hit the brick. It's going to run down the brick. And by the way, the mortar joints absorb a lot of water. But now it's going to get sucked into that hole through through surface tension okay, or, or, um, or through just absorption and now it's going to cause more rusting and a lot of times when it rusts it starts to lift if it's a lintel now you're getting cracks in the brick and you're having structural problems and lifting of parapets and that possesses it brings out a whole new set of problems and here's just a couple of pictures of poor brick installation okay these are people uh, one how are you going to put the dryer vent cap on that upper right how do you seal that window so it's satisfactory satisfactory uh one on left you got these ties the, the metal ties are supposed to tie the brick to the, the uh, to the structure not going to do that how are you going to vent uh, put on your vents uh, for your uh, heating system when you got a pipe right above it and of course this hose bib uh, uh, the plumber didn't realize that they're going to put a brick facade on so all these are all brick problems they're all construction problems then you have what's called brick failure. This is uh, really not brick, it's concrete, and sometimes brick will do this too, but this, this was a fire problem, and we had a lot of homes like this. Most of the homes now have been all removed, all the brick has been removed, because when it sucks in water, it freezes and spalls, and it just disintegrates. And here you could actually see we were grabbing the brick and just squeezing it, and it just turns to dust. And so if the brick isn't properly fired, or properly manufactured, or properly installed or properly engineered you're going to have problems facades can be problems too now we all know about the eaves problem you know the uh, exterior insulated finish systems or stucco uh, which had all the class action lawsuits back in the 90s um, and even insurance companies would insure homes with that they're doing it again with culture stone and culture stone basically is a nice facade but you need to put in a drainage plane and a rain screen. And here, these are $400,000 homes, and I get called out for these all the time. They buy a house, it looks great. When they buy it, it's not leaking. And then all of a sudden, they start talking about the house smells musty, or or uh, or they see some mold on a wall, okay? Or they've got carpenter ants. So then we go in and try to figure out where it's leaking. And here you can see where I'm actually dumping two gallons of water and the culture stone sucked it all in. You can see the infrared thermal image where it's darker blue. That's two, two and a half gallons of water. And then it let me cut a hole in the garage wall and I removed the drywall. And you can see how the water is just dripping off the staples. And so this is happening all over the house. And that's all because the culture stone was not properly installed. It did not have a space, uh, a drainage plane, a, dr a drainage space, nor did it have a rain screen or a drainage plane. And so how do you fix this? You have to tear it all down. And we see a lot of scaffold now in neighborhoods where we're tearing all this stuff down because they were not installing a rain screen. 
Here's a house that we did a test with, and I usually like to test it with a hose. So you can see I'm testing it with the hose, and 15 minutes later, it's dripping into the living room. And you know, and, and my client says, well, how can I fix this? I said, you gotta tear it down. Well, can I paint it? Well, you could try to seal it with a sealer and try to you know, detour some of that water, but basically, there's a brand new house, it's leaking. If the whole house is going to rot out, he's got to tear it off. And here's one, uh, EFIS, I mentioned earlier, where we remove the EFIS, and you can't see this inside because you have drywall and you can't see it outside, but the house stinks, and it's rotting from the inside out. They had carpenter ants, and you could see how the moisture in behind this synthetic stucco, it was a product also known as Drive It. And EF stands for Insulated Exterior Finish or Fascia Systems. And these class action lawsuits are all over with. So if you're buying an EF system or a house that's got uh, cultured stone, you better check. Here's a picture of an EF system close up, and you can see there's no rain screen on the back. In other words, Tyvek. And certain uh, um, engineering firms and building science uh, uh, consultants will recommend two layers of Tyvek or maybe just one layer of rain screen, but you can't just put it on the OSB like this because it's gonna rot out. Siding hardy board, this is uh, that nice wood that they color, you see it in a lot of new homes. That has to be installed properly too, and when hardy board first initially uh, brought this out to the public, they said you had to paint the back of it. Who do you think actually painted the backside? Probably nobody. They said you had to paint the edges when you cut it. Who did that? I never seen a siding company and a siding carpenter on a ladder nailing this stuff with a paintbrush. So it was a problem, and and you need to. It needs to be sealed. Today the hardy board is painted on the backside, and they also use like spacer clips. But again, hardy board needed to have proper rain screen and drainage plane. Here you can see where we removed the window trim, all rotted. And we're talking major developments with these problems. So if you buy a house with hardy board, you better find out uh, if it was properly installed. You better find out, you know, from from the association if it happens to be a condominium if there's other problems in the building with this and, and if they've made repairs so you want to do your research and you want to make sure that your home inspector knows about hardy board knows about eaves knows about cultured stone cladding systems okay material failure here so you see this vinyl and you look at it and you go oh well that must have been defective vinyl well they have discovered uh, that uh, it's not the vinyl that's defective. It's actually a poor installation. And it, this is a really tough one because the next one to slide show you that uh, what's causing this material phase or, uh, failure, it's actually a reflection of the sun on the neighbor's window, reflects onto the siding and actually melts the siding. Uh, uh, people couldn't believe this was happening, but uh, we've been finding it more and more. And it's a difficult thing for, your, for, for the home buyer to deal with. What do you, what do? You do? You plant a tree? Well, you might be able to plant a tree, but you got to talk to the neighbor next door and tell them, hey, your windows are causing me problems. Usually this happens on the southern exposure because what happens is with the high azimuth of the sun in the summer, when it hits the neighbor's house, especially when they're close together, um, and it hits the low E glass, the low E glass reflects it to the siding on the south side, and then it heats it up to a point where it melts it. This was a case study we did, um, and we basically, it was a Canadian case study, and we just asked them to uh, show us pictures uh, of, of, the, um, of the reflection, and basically they sent us these pictures, and it, this was actually uh, uh, a skylight that was reflecting, and you could see the skylight reflection moving down the house, and as soon as it would hit an area where it would heat up, it would hit a certain temperature and melt. And a lot of times you go by houses in the summer and you see these reflections. These are window reflections. And if they're hot enough, they can melt your siding. This is siding that's approximately 30, 40 years old. So it's not something new. And it usually never melted until the e-glass window was installed. The Marvin Window Company, they had issues with their wood. They had a pilt preservation uh, uh, liquid that they put into the wood while well, they put the wrong stuff in it. and basically what happened is their wood started to deteriorate after four or five years you just found the windows deteriorating most of these windows now if they're still out there have been repaired with wood fillers and they're painted so anytime you see a window that's been repaired painted patched caulked you got to really think about why it's been painted patched and caulked uh, now, this was a this was a big house that uh, mark one eye uh, inspected. It was uh, north-facing along Lake Erie. 
and well, we discovered that all these windows along the north side were deteriorating. Why were they deteriorating? Inadequate material, the, the material that they used could not withstand the weathering and they all began to deteriorate. A huge, huge problem. And this problem actually was a bigger problem than that because these windows were Pella windows and Pella came out with a new glass uh, called Proline Series. And the Proline Series had aluminum skin on the outside with the wood interior. And what happens with the Pella Proline windows is the aluminum serves as a vapor barrier. And so as humidity leaves the house through vapor diffusion, it hits the aluminum clad skin, which in the wintertime is cold, causing a dew point and breaks the bond. So then water can leak into this gap now, and then it rots out the whole window. So these windows, a lot of times have been caulked. A lot of times you go to home, and you'll figure out that some windows are new and some are old by looking at the serial numbers. And what you'll find out is that any window that's over 10 years old by Pella will not be warranted. And so you're kind of stuck with the rotted aluminum clad windows. There was many class action lawsuits that uh, resulted as of these defective windows. And we today have millions of these windows throughout the country. Aluminum clad windows are rotting in many homes and they rot much quicker if you have high indoor humidity. Okay, in the end of the story of this, we had, this is a, Marco and I both did this. This was a joint inspection, Marco and I, $10 million deal. Uh, around three years later, this home finally sold for $4 million. So Marco and I, was, we were hoping that we'd get a little bit of that $6 million that we saved that guy from buying it. I remember. I'm waiting on that check. Yeah, I remember we were trying to tell our client about this problem, and he was sitting there with the homeowner, and they didn't they were discussing on whose jet engine was more efficient and so we never got to tell about the rotting windows until they read the report okay so here we're talking about material failure but it's a combination of this material failure and as many things that were we do during the 10 plagues there's actually a combination i would say this material favor failure but also but also bad location here is the house located in the lowest <coughs> uh Elevation within the city. Well, it wasn't the, quite the lowest. It was right next to the sewage treatment plant. So there was one area that was lower. There was one uh, uh, building that was lower than that. And so what happened? You had uh, the plant uh, pumps break, fail, and what happens? You got sewers backing up into the house. And so, you know, if you're the house next to a sewer treatment plant, you have to think of all the houses above you. And it's all gravity flow. So every time somebody flushes the toilet, the water runs downhill. So if the line breaks where you live, the water's going to keep flowing because people are going to keep flushing their toilets. And so here's our client was showing us how the water was gushing out uh, of, of the floor drains. It was gushing out of the sinks and toilets. And he basically said he had to open his door so the water would flow out of his house. Several years ago, they came out with polybutyl plumbing, and there was uh, catastrophic failures throughout the system uh, systems that they installed. And they finally realized that they had to come up with better type of clamps. But when you see this type of plumbing in a house, you're guaranteed to have problems. Uh, of course, they've they've they fixed that problem. And the plastic plumbing they're installing now is a lot better. The PEX is working a lot better. But uh, when you see stuff like this, the gray with the uh, copper bands, you're guaranteed to have problems. And, and it's called it's called poly, polybutylene plumbing. And basically, it, it, chemically, it fails because it fails if it's exposed to sun. It also fails from fatigue. And one of the other failures is because the crimping connectors uh, weren't sometimes too tight or not tight enough. And you have a house with this stuff in it, you probably have to replace all your house plumbing because it can break in the wall at any time. And so this is definitely, definitely a plague, polybutylene plumbing. Um, a lot of flat roofs are bad too. What happens is people have a roof that leaks, so they call a roofer, and he says, oh, we'll put another roof on top of this roof, but they never dry it, so they put the next roof on, and what do you think is going to happen when the sun comes out? It's gonna, The moisture is going to come back out and cause a new roof to fail, and you can see all the bubbles just popping. Uh, electric, electro low voltage wire systems, they were very popular during the 60s and 70s, and uh, they were installed for convenient purposes. You could turn on all the lights in your house by one switch next to your bed. But what they've discovered is over time, the transformers and the relays failed. And because 
They were two incompatible type systems, one meaning transformers and relays from the 60s versus the ones that they're doing today. They were incompatible. So when you have a house that has low voltage wiring, you really strongly want to recommend to the owners that you have, or the buyers, that you have a complete analysis done because there are going to be problems down the road. And, and a lot of times when you have these systems, you may think that a light bulb is burned out and it's not. You're going to have to rewire that whole circuit. Um, another electrical problem you run into back in the late 60s and early 70s was aluminum wiring. And during the wars, they, they switched from copper aluminum, aluminum. And the problem was that the aluminum would react uh, differently when it was connected to copper um, uh, conductors. And so when you put aluminum wire connected to a switch or an outlet, then you would have a, uh, an imbalance there and corrosion. And so aluminum wiring was a big problem. It caused a lot of fires. And they had to go back in and replace all the outlets and all these switches with aluminum uh, copper type rated outlets. So you want to also, you know, any house built in the late 60s and early 70s, you want to open the electrical panel and double check for aluminum branch circuits. Okay, we have our fa favorite box here called the Federal Pacific Box. These were installed throughout the United States, 50s, 60s, 70s, even up into the 80s. And uh, the manufacturer basically got caught cheating on some of the tests. Also, they had problems with some of the design of the circuit breakers, and you got resistance. And, and of course, now everybody knows that this is a uh, potentially serious defect in a house. And if you find these in the house, you certainly have to tell the homeowners. Uh, potential homeowners that they should get rid of them. And and the reason they're called stab lock is because you would stab it into the box and push it down. And what happens is after some time they become loose and they start to arc. And that is the problem with stab lock Federal Pacific panels. Uh, chimney structure problems, you know, there's a lot of things that could go wrong with chimneys. You could have leaning, settling, spillage of fumes because of, you know, eddy currents and, and, and downdrafts. And sometimes smoke can come into the house, odors and cracks. And sometimes they start pulling away from structures. And so all chimneys should be looked at, inspected and tested by chimney expert, chimney professionals. Uh, you want to look inside the chimneys and check out the flue liners. You want to look at the outsides of the chimneys and make sure that, you know, they're not uh, pulling apart or they're failing. Okay, plague number seven. This is basically uh, talking about incompatibility of building materials. You have one product and put it with another and it causes problems. And here's a good example we have putting plastic over uh, fiberglass insulation. Well, you're putting up a vapor barrier here and it's just not going to work because either way, if it's from the outside in or the inside out, you're going to run into problems because you can't have uh, moisture uh, diffusing through the material. The the uh, interior vapor barrier, basically, uh, you really don't want to use interior vapor barriers in cold climate zones. And cold climate zones would include probably like 75% of America. And basically what happens is when you do that, uh, you will have condensation problems and you could rot the walls from the inside out. Um, vinyl wallpaper is the same. The old hotels back in the you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, had vinyl wallpaper. To be a four-star hotel, you had to have vinyl wallpaper. And vinyl wallpaper is basically a piece of plastic. And so if you had brickwork on the outside and it rained, and the rain got sucked into the brick, then the sun would come out and heat the brick, then the water would be diffuse, it would hit the vinyl wallpaper and cause condensation. And then you'd have interior mold growing interstitially in the wall. And this was a lot of our hotels had this problem. You could see where we're pulling up the vinyl wallpaper, and this is what you would see, mold and mildew. A lot of our builders today decided to install plastic vapor barriers on the inside of the drywall. Probably six mil plastic behind your, your uh, wallpaper because it, it can cause, uh, it doesn't let your house breathe. Okay, uh, here's a case study where it was a brand new house and about eight years later they were complaining about odors and carpenter ants. See, carpenter ants and wood boring insects like moisture. Here you can see where we took the drywall down, found the plastic, and, and then you look at the sheathing, the uh, uh, um, OSB sheathing, you can see mold and mildew growing in that cavity because water was getting in there. And you can see the bottom of it where it was rotting. Here's one where we took off the siding, we found the plastic, and the entire house was rotting. The entire corner plate was rotting, and this this was only like 10 years old. 
and so um, you don't want to install interior vapor barriers in cold weather climate zones. You can see how bad this is. And uh, they also had carbon wrap problems, odor problems, and mold problems. Waterproofing companies also like to install these things called Humidex, uh, easy breathe machines. We also call them fan in the box. And what they say is these, 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 these machines, which basically are just the fans suck in your basement, they say, well, suck the bad air out of your house. The moist air, you know, falls to the floor, and it'll, it's like a dehumidifier. They, they call them non-condensing dehumidifiers. Yeah. Okay? Well, and they basically, as Marco said, they just suck the air, the conditioned air, out of your house, uh, and they're big energy drains. Uh, cause negative basement pressure, you know, and also they act when they suck the air out, then more air's got to come back in. And where's it going to come from? Probably from the sub pump. So now we're sucking in moist air from the sub pump, stone odors. It's going to come from cracks, from window, you know. And, and so basically, you want to run a real dehumidifier, not a non condensing dehumidifier. And if you're going to put a fan in your house, you definitely don't want to be sucking your basement. And the last thing you want to do is create basement negative pressure because it will cause all kind of problems. Now here's a, a picture of a, uh, a vent, a chimney, that used to have both a heater, a heating system, a gas heater, and a hot water tank that was gas fired also. Both going into it, they transformed it into one that only had a hot water tank going into. There wasn't enough energy in the hot water tank. Flue gases, and you run into a condensation problem. The new codes now require that if you only have a hot water tank and a chimney, they got to be lined. It's something very important you got to tell your client. And this will cause efflorescence and peeling paint on your chimney in the basement. Now, this is a condominium complex, and it looks great when you go upstairs and look at it. But if you go into the parking garage below the unit, you're going to see that it's about to collapse. And you can see what the beams should look like and what the beams look like underneath the drains. And basically, this beam is completely rusting through. And what's sitting above it are four condominium complexes. And here's the problem. What they did is they built the parking garage in the four condominium complexes on the top. And in the parking garage, they butterflied the roof so there was a little drain. So all the water that would run off the garage and the house would run into this little drain. Unfortunately, it was under design drain and it would hold water and leak. And while it would leak, it would leak into the parking garage below and cause rusting. And these people would not would, we're not going to repair this because we brought it to their attention. You can look at this close up and you'll see that you're going to be living above this connection. What do you think is going to happen soon? Well, this was their solution to fix the problem. They were more worried about water dripping onto the car, so they put up tarps. And they said, there's nothing wrong with our parking garage. We fixed the problem. And not only that, it was also causing rusting of columns and causing rusting of metal conduits. So now you're going to have electrically energized conduits and potentially cause uh, issues with electrocutions. And so these people here, you can see how they, they covered their car and they covered the wall and the problem was fixed. Okay, we're moving on to plague number eight here. Deterioration caused by pests. Uh, we have numerous areas uh, examples of uh, deterioration of a house caused by a pest. And here we have a, one, of course, this is by a squirrel. Squirrel got in there, a little opening, and they're going to come in. It gets pretty cold uh, the winter time, and they're looking for a nice warm place to live. Termites, um, wood boring insects. Uh, basically, the wood boring insects up in, in, in Northern America were worried about are termites, powderful beetles, and carpenter ants. There's two types of termites there's uh, Formosian termites, which live above ground and subterranean termites will live below ground. So depending on where you live are the ones you want to look for. But termites generally are hard to find unless you actually see their, their damaged, deflected floors, cracks in walls, or you actually see their sheltered tubes. This particular house, you wouldn't see anything because the termites happen to be coming up through the center of the masonry foundation block. They came up through the center of the block, went into the sill plate, and ate all the wood below in the crawl space. So repairing termite damage can be expensive. Okay, carpenter ants are, uh, are also a major problem in uh, North America. Uh, most of the time, carpenter ant problems are associated with moisture entry into the house. So you have to find out where the moisture is getting into the house, and then you'll be able to deal.
with the carpenter ants. Some people, they find carpenter ants and they start spraying and they come back. But the problem is, is that moisture get into the house. Carpenter ants like it moist, they like it damp, they like it cool. And so you have to find out where the moisture is entering the house. And speaking of moisture, termites also like moisture and so do powder post beetles. And those are basically your three big wood boring insect type uh, damaging pests. You know, other types of ant, ants can be problems too. This was, uh, for we call it the forensic red ant study. And this was interesting. We had a female com with a compulsive disorder complain about no heat in any of her rooms. And um, she also had all her rooms full of boxes, cans, and newspapers. And in the springtime, she'd see these flying ants, and she said they would bite her all the time. And, you know, we're talking one of these people that was a collector, so you couldn't really walk in this home. Well, we finally figured out what was happening to the heat. Basically, all her heat ducts, she had a slab house in the bedrooms, and we had to move boxes to find these heat registers. And we found out that most of the heat registers were filled with sand to the top. We're like, well, how did the sand get in there? Somebody had to move the sand. And, you know, ants can move sand. So let's say ants would be living underneath the slab and they wanted to make their homes or galleries. Well, what are they going to do with the sand? they got to move it. And so they have to take each grain of sand and move it and dump it in a big hole. And where's the biggest hole that they didn't need? Well, they did use it was the, the duck. So, the sand, so all the ants moved the sand. Then we went into the kitchen and she also had a pet problem. She had like four cats and a couple dogs. And her idea of personal hygiene was sweeping the kitchen floor, cat food, nibbles and bits into the floor register. And so going through the house, we also noticed dead red ants everywhere. And by the way, red ants do bite. Okay. And, and uh, so what was happening in this particular home was the ants made their galleries and homes underneath the bedrooms. They took the sand and dumped it into the su supply ducts. Or return ducts. Then they traveled through the ducts in a long journey to the kitchen, where they ate nibbles and bits, and then they came back to their uh, uh, back to their uh, uh, their homes. So they had their own ecosystem. And in the meantime, our client was getting bit by red ants, and she was had she had uh, reproductive flying ants all over. So we're going to talk a little bit about powder pose beetle here. Uh, powder pose beetles. Uh, are directly associated with moisture in the wood. You usually find it with uh, the homes that were built prior to the turn of the 20th century. You still find it in homes today, but what happens is that the powder post beetle, there's usually no catastrophic failure, but what happens is the wood becomes weak, and as this lower picture shows you, you hit it and all the dust comes out, and uh, the powder post beetle is a relatively easy thing to eliminate if they're even there, what happens is the wood loses strength. And as the next slide will show you, we had a large... Uh, 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 it, in the same, before I flip it, Jimmy, uh, I want you to look at that top picture, and when it loses strength, it also cracks the joists. And when the joists crack, then you have deflections of the floor. And if you look at right above us is the upper floor, and what is there? A granite countertop. They added, they redid the kitchen, they added this big heavy thing in there, this island, and it cracked the joist because it was weak. And so, powder post beetles, to get rid of them, is you need to decrease the moisture content through proper water management, proper dehumidification, proper condition crawl space design, and you know, sometimes you've got to treat and kill them also. Sometimes these powder post beetles will stay in the wood for a long time. We have other pests such as groundhogs, and you can't have groundhogs living around your house because what they're going to do is they're going to undermine everything. They're going to undermine walks. They're going to make holes. Then water's going to go down into these holes, and it's going to leak in your basement. And so those guys are a problem. Okay. Well, yeah, another problem that we have, of course, uh, with squirrels. Uh, but this was a problem that uh, it was brought to our attention. Uh, somebody said their house smell. The tenant complained, the landlord said it's not an issue, tenant complained, so we were brought out there and we said, okay, let's find what's the problem here. So we had a little device here that we're able to determine the smell, where it's coming from. We found it was coming from out of an outlet. Now, the nose is a pretty good uh, tool to use, but 
it never hurts to have an instrument. So we brought along a union carpenter and said, hey, uh, I don't know, is this a union carpenter? No, this guy's cutting the wire above it. <laughs> a trained union carpenter, let's put it that way. He said, okay, the smell is behind there. Let's find out what's behind it. He cut it out, and what do you think he found? There it goes. There's little uh, the squirrely back there dangling in there, and that's what was smelling. So the tenant wasn't lying. So the moral of the story here is you probably need to cut all tree branches that hang over your house. Look for the tree branches. If you got tree branches hanging over the house, also look at gutters. A lot of times gutters and downspouts, if they're dirty, they have stains from raccoons that are going up and they make bigger holes. And the squirrels will jump on the roof and they'll cut and cut holes underneath the soffits by the roof line and gutters. And so you want to keep the animals off your roof. Okay, so our carpenter had to pull out the roof and we gave the carcass to the landlord who then had to take it out. What do you think's wrong with this picture? Uh, the dog's dead. The dog's dead? How yeah. do you know that? You know, I, 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 he was sleeping there in the middle of my inspection and he didn't move so I put my gauge on him and he was dead. Apparently people start to, they're stuffing their animals now. I don't think there's anything wrong with this picture. No? No. Okay, so we're going to talk about something that uh, uh, might seem, you know, uh, uh, slightly innocuous, but actually it, it's really something that could cause serious, serious respiratory disease. It could cause his, histoplasmosis. That's a $50 word, Marco. Anyways, or you could have cryptococcus, uh, and that actually is a disease that affects the central nervous system. Here's a situation where you go up to the attic. Again, you don't want to have generally have uh, uh, furnaces and attics that are in unprotected uh, uh, spaces. And here you have all the pigeons up there, and you can just imagine what's going and spreading in the house with all the uh, pigeon uh, pigeon dropping in the attic. Very very unhealthy condition. Mice, you know, mice are okay until they start chewing your wires. And so, and also get inside electrical boxes. So you make sure that you've got knockouts and plug covers in your electrical box. If they, you know, get in your electrical box and short out or chew wires, you could cause electrical problems in your home. Uh, also, in the attics, if they're up in your attics, they can chew wires, heat up wires. And so, good mice are generally dead mice. Raccoons, okay? We, we uh, talked a little bit, not a lot about it, but raccoons can actually climb up a gutter. They'll jump on a fence, climb up a gutter, and look at all the downspouts and gutters. If they're all black and dark and dirty, that's an indication that the raccoons are getting up into the attic. And once they get in the attic, you know, they're going to ruin all your insulation because they're going to urinate everywhere. They're going to pack it down, ruin the R value. Now, they do have latrines, so the bottom line is if you've got a raccoon in your attic, you're probably going to need to call your insurance company and you're going to have to remove all the insulation, sanitize and re-insulate. Raccoons also, when they're in the attic, can damage heat ducts, damage insulation, they can cause thermal bridging conditions which can also lead to uneven snow melts on your roof and now you're getting ice dams. So raccoons can cause ice dams. We're going to go to Plague 9. This is called Interior Environmental Contamination.